Hi, this is Joe from JRX and we've decided to put out a video tutorial, a video manual for want of a better word for the 105. It's a lot easier nowadays to sit back and watch a video opposed to trawling through documentation. So first off, let's speak about the flight model. We've been working hard to get the flight model correct with the next plane. We haven't specifically focused on aerobatics. We know that the 105 is famous for that, probably made famous by the flying balls. You can try aerobatics, see how you get on. We are using the same airfoil as a uh, the real life one, so give it a go. But don't come to the forum and say the flight model's wrong because you crashed when you tried to do a loop because we haven't specifically focused on doing that. So next we're just going to look at a couple of system settings if we come to the options here. And under the general tab we need to have HDR selected. The reason why is because all of the instruments and other lights, internal and external, have real spill lights. If you're not on HDR it's just going to be pretty dark. So. If your system can handle it, we want the HDR. The second options I want to speak about are under the general tab. First off, flight models per frame. Mine is on three. This is generally system based. If you've got a super system, then you should be up here. But for me, it's three. If you find that the aircraft jumps around on the ground, and some do, this is where you can fix that. You can just lower it. So whatever your preference is there, you can set that accordingly. And finally, under the settings, we need to have, if you want, but I do highly recommend to use the experimental flight model. And I do believe that at some point this is going to be the standard in X-Plane and this option will eventually disappear. Just going to speak now about hardware control and input into the aircraft and what you need to do for setup. So we get our little book out here. I've spoken about this before on the startup and shutdown tutorial, but maybe not everyone's seen it. So we do have quite a few options to control the throttles and the other input devices in the aircraft. This is how the aircraft loads by default and it's set on the wing sweep axis just here. And this is under the settings and joystick. Just here, so our throttle assignment needs to be on wing sweep and not throttle. And in most cases, but not all, depending on the type of hardware you have, we need to have the reverse axis ticked, but you can try it and see which one works. And the rest of the input controls are pretty much standard aircraft helicopter type controls. This is my personal choice for control sensitivity and our test pilot who flies a real 105 every day agrees so we've got about 10 percent on the main controls but again this will be personal choice and personal preference whilst we're on the subject of throttles let's go up to the throttle overhead and just have a quick look at a couple of things so when we're starting the engine these won't be active until we have clicked the the push gate button here that's the throttle now active and if we were starting fuel would be going into the engine and now I have control on my hardware controller and obviously the same for the other one. There, so I now have control. If you chose the other option in the flight binder you would have individual mouse control or button or keyboard or VR controller for each throttle and when we're closing down it's the same process we do need to make sure that the throttles are fully retarded you'll see them go back ever so slightly there and then we can just click the push button and, the push button. and that's really all there is to it for that quite simple once you've done it a couple of times and the final part of the system setup is general navigation around the cockpit there is a lot in this cockpit and there's a lot around that you can click on and if you're unsure or it's the first time you've used the aircraft we can turn on the click regions and we can see what's what so if you find that you're clicking on something and it's not working that you might be off a little bit I have tried to keep them very general, big where possible, and animated. 
So that's all the boring stuff out of the way. Let's have a look at aircraft configuration. Back into the binder book. Uh, what we have here, options that can be changed at any time are as follows. You can add and remove the AVI tab, the GTN 750, you can turn on and off rotor shadows and you can change the controller type on the fly. Every other option here cannot be changed unless you're on the ground. As you make changes on the aircraft configuration, the weight will change dynamically and you'll see the aircraft total weight value change here. Most of the options are self-explanatory, so I won't insult your intelligence in telling you what they are, but I will just focus on a couple of things. So this aircraft comes as standard with the great AVI tab and the GTN 750. We can just show you them in action now. We're going to need the battery on. And we're going to need, I'll just turn everything on till they come on. There we go. So we have AVI tab here and we have the GTN here. If you don't have either of these modules, you will just have a black screen. Don't worry about it. It won't cause any harm. You don't have to buy them. But if you do own them, they're already up and running by default. The final aircraft configuration option I want to speak about is the Detail Autopilot Unit. We'll bring that up and have a look. So I only added this in for personal testing. It wasn't a concept that I wanted to bring in uh, from the start, but I have decided to leave it in and you should use it at your peril. Don't expect to fly this aircraft like a 737. You need to be good straight level stable flight with some altitude before you should really consider turning it on. But it will hold head in well, it will climb and descend for you and it will also do a full instrument approach should you wish to try that. Just be aware that if you're not using the autopilot that it's not left in this state with the green light. And that's because X-Plane is still controlling the surveys and you may find that your flight controls are not responding to what you expect them to be. So just make sure when you do transition from autopilot back to manual flight that this is off. We're flying at 7,000 feet somewhere over the south of England. I've changed the field of view so we can see more. And I've turned down the engine sounds so I don't get drowned out. And we're going to jump in and just have a quick look at some of the instrumentation. A lot of it's quite basic, but there will be a couple of items that I want to talk about. So let's begin. So whilst we're in the air, let's just come back to the autopilot unit. We're currently on heading hold and altitude hold. An item I forgot to mention when we're speaking about it on the ground that the vertical speed, every time you click the button, it resets the vertical speed value to zero. So we don't go climbing up or descending when we're not expecting it. You can have to manually readjust the value each time you bring the instrument on. I've also been doing some work on the speed hold and the results aren't great. We don't have a lot of throttle to play with. If we look on the N2 gauge, you can see that the engine can only really range between these two markers here. It works, but it's not that accurate. And I've also added on the pilot's speed indicator a speed bug, which is still under trial and it may or may not make it into the final version. So let's start at the top. If we click here, we get the X-Play map come up and click again to stow. We've already extensively spoken about the uh, flight reference card binder and that's accessed in this area here. Let's just go along the top now. Pito heater one indicator. This is showing that it's off and this is an example of pito heat tube that's on. So white off, black on. Fire test buttons accessed here and here outer middle and inner marker indicators are here and the marker sensitivity switch is here it's also on the audio panel which we'll come on to later next to that we have the horizon power switch for the pilots artificial horizon co-pilot speed indicator in knots and the pilots airspeed indicator in knots the only difference between the two is that i have added this 
temporary speed setting bug. The Bendix King distance measuring equipment. This is tied to nav one and nav two, and it will give you distance, speed, and time to your desired location. Below this are the two lighting rear stats for the panel and the flood lighting. The panel instrument lighting switch is here. And the brightness is adjusted here for white. And we have a green spill light, which you can use at night, quite useful. Co-pilots and pilots attitude indicators, these are fully cageable. When they're first powered up, and they are powered off different systems, the pilot's instrument is on a direct line to the battery, and the co-pilot's side is on the AC bus. So, yeah, fully cageable. You can adjust the horizon line to a value of your choice, and we have the turn and slip indicator on each one. Standard aircraft altimeter, one for the co-pilot and one for the pilot fully adjustable for the current pressure you can set standard pressure by clicking in the middle here and if you click on the value for our americans friends you can change between millibars and inches of mercury next up is the mast moment indicator we've tried to implement the best we can if you fly the, the aircraft inside the desired flight envelope you're probably never going to see this come on and that's because you really need to be doing something bad to get a deflection like that. The definition for this device, and I'll read it verbatim because I'll probably get a lot of questions about this, is as follows. Because large cyclic displacements on the ground have the potential to damage the mast assembly, a mast moment indicator is installed. The gauge is a single dimension indicator that shows the total moment being applied to the mask. So there you go. Basically it's saying when you're on the ground, be gentle with the cyclic. Coming further down to the bottom left now, we have the engine oil temperature and the engine oil pressure. Temperature at the top, pressure at the bottom. Engine number one is in red and engine number two is green. And above that, you have the rotor transmission temperatures and pressures. Whilst we're in the area for engine monitoring, we have the TOT, turbine outlet temperature for engine number one and engine number two. And below each of them, we have the N1% for engine one and engine two. And at the bottom of the panel, we have the fuel gauges. We have on the left, the fuel quantity. This is in kilopounds and we have a total all up weight of fuel of 456 kilograms which works out nicely to 150 us gallons the indicator on the left hand side is the main tank that draw down first and to the right side is the supply tank next to that we have the standard fuel pressure gauge and down the middle we have the cwp or the central warning panel here this is all your standard warnings that we have within aircrafts. Most of these indicators are tied to built-in X-plane faults. So if you induce any faults, you will see the indicators come on accordingly. Below that, we have the digital outside air temperature and above the pilot's head, we have the analog version. In this area here, we have the CWP test switch. Below that, we have the AVAD automatic voice alerting device test. That will give you height callouts from 1500 down to 10 and you can also set a minimum height value on the radio altimeter here. And if you don't want to have that on, you can just spend it any time just there. So if there's one thing that you really need to take away from this video is the bit I'm going to speak about next and that's all to do with engine power. This aircraft is not particularly fast. It's quite a big lump to move through the air. Realistically, with a decent amount of weight and an 86% torque, we're only going to be getting between 100 and about 115 knots. It will normally settle around about 110, but we have been burning a decent amount of fuel since we started. So about 104 kilos have gone since I've started the video. We was at 110, but now we're a little bit lighter. The speed has crept up. If you're someone who likes to fly at high altitude, this aircraft will go up to 17,000 feet. 
it won't do it with a lot of weight and you're going to need a lot of time to get up there and finally on the torque gauge because this is a critical item i have added a failure in if you over torque the engine up to 115 percent for 15 seconds or more you will have a double engine failure whereupon you'll have to auto rotate all the way down to the ground to the right of the torque meter we have the rotor and engine rpm percent gauge this is monitoring the n2 speeds and the rotor rpm the maximum or the standard rotor rpm for cruising is 424 revolutions per minute and this gauge once the governor takes control will just generally settle down in the green range if you go into an auto rotation state the maximum rotor rpm that is allowable is 110 and you may have to control that if it's over speeding with a little bit of collective and the ideal speed that you should be looking at on your way down to the ground is about 80 knots so i think that's most of the primary instruments discussed we're just going to talk about what's left and uh, most of that's nav equipment so just here we have the obs compass this is tied to nav 2 radio which is down here and again this is a pretty standard aircraft instrument should you wish to learn how to use this or any of the other ones there are lots and lots of excellent tutorials online uh, but these are all fully functional under the pilot's ball we have the bendix king hsi this is fully functional and again there's lots of tutorials on how to use this this is on nav 1 radio and the green indicators are on the nav 2 frequency if you're using the AP heading hold, then we have the heading bug just here. Just a point to note for the owners of the RXP 750 or other versions. I spent a week trying to fix my broken HSI because it wasn't working only to find out that this setting here the CDI setting was on GPS and as you can see this now doesn't work so just be aware there is probably a setting within the 750 that I could change to give me uh, control over both but this will take over the navigation system whilst it's in GPS mode Below the HSI we have a single needle gauge ADF automatic direction finder on the HF frequency on the ADF radio just here. And at the very bottom by the pilot's knee is the clock with a built in stopwatch and that can be activated uh, if you click the right side of this bezel here you'll start if you click again you'll stop and if you click the left side you'll reset if you want to do any calculations the old way then you then we have a rotating bezel as well so you can set markers down in the bottom right hand corner we have the radio altitude meter this goes from 1500 down to zero feet as i mentioned earlier you can set a height bug where you'll get a visual and the audio warning if you want to mute the audio warning that can be done here and finally on the main panel we have this little gauge down here which is to do with compass synchronization this hasn't been fully implemented only other than that this is animated when you power up so the increase and decrease switches won't actually do anything so i think for the entire panel everything is a hundred percent fully functional aside from the MMI gauge which is partial and the compass control which doesn't really do too much so we're not doing too bad in the functionality states so far down in the main pedal stall area now and having a quick look aside from the circuit breakers which I'll come on to shortly everything here works as described so we've got the main and emergency bus feed i won't switch any of these off because we're on autopilot and we don't want to turn that off whilst we're flying the main and emergency bus feed are the dc power the ac power are on inverter one and inverter two the engine anti-icing one and two is tied to a real x-plane data ref and that will prevent any icing should you go up to high altitude the instrument light we've spoken about already the fuel jettison 
is working in full so if you want to start dumping fuel we can switch that there it doesn't all go straight away it will go down at a reasonable rate i think that's set but i will check by default inside x-plane the only thing currently on this pre-release version on this part that hasn't been implemented yet is the hydraulic test switch uh, there is a checklist or number of checklist items which uses this and i have been speaking with my 105 pilot and we're gonna sort this out either before or on the first update after release the wipers are functional although i don't plan to do any windscreen rain effects just yet because with x-plane 12 around the corner i'm going to let them do the work and then we can come in after and get it working on our version so the volts and the amp meters are here there is a test that you can do and it is in the procedures in the binder but basically you can test your amp draw currently we're drawing 50 amps which isn't quite correct if you start this engine up automatically using start engines to run in or start with engines running for some reason x-plane puts the draw down at about 50 amps that's actually not the case if you do a manual start yourself then you'll probably get a more accurate reading so the emergency fuel valves are fully working if we switch these off now it will cut fuel to the engine and we will be going down a rapid rate of knots so I'm not going to do that, but I can assure you they both work. We spoke about these in the startup and shutdown tutorial. Engine starter one and engine starter two. There is a vent run option if you bring the switch down this way. Battery or the EPU. There is a little man who comes out with an EPU and plugs into the nose. So you can get external power. Obviously you can't do that whilst you're in the air. And the generator switches. Back to the circuit breakers. Some of these are currently functional, some are not functional yet, and some may never be functional. And that's purely because what they do and how X-Plane works internally. We do have working floats on the aircraft. If we arm the floats, we get a warning on the CWP. And should we have some sort of failure and we need to land on water, we once we're armed, we just need to hit emergency floats. And if we look outside, there they are. So we will now float. It's not a boat. It's not a pleasant experience at all, but it's enough to save you and the aircraft. If you want to stow the floats, obviously this is a simulator so we can do it very quickly. It'd be a hell of a mess to sort out in real life. Let's jump back in and it's reverse order. The switch went on last. So we'll take the switch off and we will pull the circuit breaker and that should stowed them away nice and neatly. Just a point to note regarding the floats, that process is obviously not going to work unless you have the floats selected as an option before you take off. So unlike me, if you like speaking to people, we got the VHF1 and VHF2 radios, which we can use with the excellent X-Plane ATC, which they've had 20 years to develop. And they will be obviously fully functional. Just above the two nav radios, we have the fire extinguisher one and two. I have tied in the engine fire failures from within X-Plane so you can extinguish your real fire. Now the only problem is is that X-Plane will shut down the engine. In real life firing off the extinguishers in a 105 will not shut down the engine. I haven't really come across a workaround because the failure system is quite internal to X-Plane so try and land before you put the fire out that's all I can say. The circuit breakers for these both work and to fire off flip the switch. So we can continue with the rest of the items whilst we're on the ground. We've got the GPU out with the uh, external power coming into the aircraft. Below the fire panel we have NAV1, NAV2 and the ADF radio. These are all standard in their operation. Just a point to note with the ADF one, 
we need to when we turn it on we need to click it twice the first click goes into the antenna mode but for the ADF to actually work we need to be on ADF for those of you that's never used this sort of radio before the Collins version we change the frequency the large numbers on the lower bezel and the small numbers on the top bezel and to make it active we just flip for the transponders currently a little bit finicky I've put the click zones on so we can see what we're doing so this isn't transmitting at the moment until we click mode then we get the yellow diamond and if we click mode again we should get the AC and S modes as well and you can just cycle through those to change the frequency there's four zones and as you can see clicking them will change them respectively for those flyers who use online ATC or anything else that asks for you to send your ID the ID button here that will invoke a transmission I think it goes on for 18 seconds or so and that way you can be identified and this version of a transponder comes with a, a flight level indication as well and this will change accordingly as you go up and down so coming down the panel we've got the standard X-Plane GNS 530 the one that comes as stock all of the functions and buttons are fully integrated to work with this I've also included should you wish and if you own the modules if you click map we get the AVI tab come up map to turn it off and if you want the GTN here that's also built in as well and again toggle off and at the very end of the pedal stool we've got the two station boxes or audio panels now the top one is acting as an audio panel so we can get our we can get our uh, marker identification and if we got any comms London Gatwick information uniform if we got any comms tuned in then we can switch between them here X plane only in real life has com 1 and 2 so the rest are not active and the box below is not acting as a station box uh, I decided that we don't need to have two exactly the same in most cases there would only be you flying anyway so what I've done is I've added helmet attenuation here and I have actually brought the sound up to the correct volume and the attenuations on so if I flip this switch off the avionics buzz is going to be quite loud I've also added there's an hour each of audio chatter I got some recordings from uh, various airports in America France and Dublin unfortunately not all countries are allowed to make their ATC uh, radio messages public uh, the ones that do uh, we can get quite easily and we can add them in if there's a particular country or if someone wants anything in particular you can contact me via the forum let me know what you want because I can easily add this in Echo Fox Mike you are cleared over the runway now uh, runway 28 left at Dublin over 28 left at Dublin thanks a million Fox Mike and Fox Mike report, we are turning south again, uh, it'll be for the Pigeon House. And Fox Mike, just repeat the end of that. I just want to head to the threshold of 28 and then we'll head uh, down uh, 28 left, sorry, and then we'll call you turning south. Is that okay? That's uh, perfect, thank you. Whilst we're in the area, we'll have a quick look at the collective. There isn't a lot active on this, to be honest. I haven't yet implemented the engine trimmer where you can increase and decrease the engine power. That's mainly because of the way the X-Plane governor currently works and the governor's got everything pretty much tied down. So for now, the engine trimmer isn't functional. We have on here the landing lights. And at some point, I may or may not add uh, cargo operations. I did do it for the Gazelle, but we'll just see how we get on with that with the old cargo hook. Some of the procedures, or most of the procedures, when you land, collective fall down and you need to apply the collective lock that's here if you click this here that's the collective now locked and you will not inadvertently be able to lift off the ground until that's taken off there used to be back in the day a cyclic lock which was a lever which used to swing down and latch onto this little nodule here i believe as far as i'm aware they they've all been removed so we're not going to be implementing that so you're going to need to make sure at all times that the controls are neutral particularly when you're starting up and shutting down 
on the cyclic grip itself the only button that is functional is the uh, the horn mute if you've seen the start up and shut down if there's a split greater than 12 percent on the n2 engine rpm needles then a horn will sound and that can be muted here this aircraft doesn't have a force trim system it has a hydraulic trim system instead and that is controlled by the china hat which is not animated i have added uh, the trim commands in the keyboard and settings here should you wish to assign your own china hat or any other combination of keyboard button or any any controller i highly recommend that you do at least add the center trim and the pitch down and pitch up trim it makes it much easier when you're flying opposed to having the uh, the controller washing out for want of a better word your arm fully forward you can just a few taps of that button assign the trim to do that for you whilst we're here i've also assigned every option in the menu binder is also a command so if there's anything in particular that you use a lot or anything that you want to bring up quickly and put away then you can assign a button just here probably haven't mentioned before but this aircraft is fully vr compatible it's been out to sim vr labs to have the treatment done and they've done a fantastic job i think they assigned over 40 buttons all tuned in that work great with controllers by default we only load up with one set of controls and it's the pilot side controls that are the vr compatible side if we do want the dual controls we can bring them on here but i don't recommend trying to fly that side in vr because it probably won't work properly i think that's an x-plane legacy problem that hopefully they'll resolve at some point and finally on the cockpit tour we can take a quick look at the overhead panel we have a hobs meter up here when this goes to release it will obviously be set at zero so you can keep track of your hours flown or operated in this aircraft pitot heat switches we've covered on the startup continuous ignition we've covered if you haven't seen the start video then you only need continuous ignition on in adverse weather conditions or conditions that could potentially cause disruption to your engines this is fire tests worn switch which isn't currently active the four main fuel pumps the gen field buttons don't do anything there isn't anything in x-plane that i can make work so they are non-functional interior light we've got a red light for night vision position anti-collision and landing lights the storm lamp is for flying in darker conditions in the storm we have a heating switch here another heater switch here and the x's are the emergency exit lights which are on on the rear not too much really on the overhead panel and that is i think everything that we need to cover for the interior 105 cockpit tour we'll talk about the paint kit i've decided just to bolt it onto the end of this get everything out of the way in one video so the aircraft ships by default with the paint kit already deployed aside opposed from me sending it out to everyone that wants to ask and that's located in the aircraft folder under paint kit if you extract this file they're psd format but they can be read in gimp as well which is a free alternative to photoshop or any other program that will open psds and if you extract them all you will end up with the following we've got the main body i did remap the body a month or so or maybe longer ago to make the paint kit more accessible to everyone it was a slight sacrifice with the uv mapping but i'd rather the users be able to paint their own skins and make it more enjoyable so this is the main body the guides are included uh, it's quite obvious what's what I have left a sample in which is that one there this one here is all the decals so this is the rivets the nuts and the bolts and everything else and the body text but it's your paint kit and if you want to change that you can everything you need for the bodies under that one also in the paint kit we have the clothing for the pilot and the co-pilot the id plate that i mentioned before is here this is again a sample 
uh, the larger one will map to the plate on the lower left and the smaller one will map to like a diner tape in the middle of the console and I'll show you where these go if you've done skins and painting before you'll probably know so if we go into the livery folders let's pick one into objects interior and what we got here is the ID plate so you'll edit that and you'll overwrite that or save that the seats front and rear as well seats just mentioned you can change the color of the seats I have made some of the military or the service style aircraft with darker interior trims so opposed to having the standard tan color I've darkened them down to match that I've also done the throttle housing as well and I think that's everything so if you're a painter everything you need is here you can obviously change more you just need to know how to do it quite straightforward once you've done your first one and that will as I said ship directly inside the aircraft folder if you don't want to listen to me droning on in a video that's potentially an hour long we do have the manual the manual is probably not as comprehensive as this video but everything you need to know to get you going is here and I've also included the real life documentation which has got an awful lot of information should you need any bedtime reading on the 105. I've modelled this aircraft with dynamic vibrations and they will change over speed and they will also change during translational lift entering and exiting now I only ever fly in VR god forbid if I had to fly in 2D again it would be impossible but there are still lots and lots of people who love and fly in 2D and the vibrations I made for some of my other models were reported predominantly by 2D users as being too much so I'm guessing that in VR I'm not seeing the vibrations as strongly as someone in 2D. Now I haven't created a menu option to change these vibrations but I can very quickly show you how you can adjust them yourself. And what you'll need for that is a notepad editor such as notepad which is built in with Windows or you can use notepad++ which is what I use and to do that we just need to follow this procedure we need to navigate to where the aircraft is we need to go to plugins xlua scripts and at the very bottom we've got vibration model and we can open that up either by open with notepad there or if you have notepad plus plus you can just open it and at the very very top here we have these values and this is the speed in knots and this is a vibration value and it will change as you speed up and slow down so if the vibrations are too strong for you then you can lower these values here and if you want more vibration then you can raise these values and then all we need to do is to save the file there's no risk there's no potential damage of losing the aircraft if you want you can take a backup of that particular file before you do it and i'm always willing to help anyone out who thinks they may have problem doing that but as i said this is not a configuration option the vibrations are there but for some people they might be too strong or even too weak so if you like delving into files and folders then it'll probably take you about less than five minutes to do this whole procedure from scratch and finally for our 105 101 we'll just take a quick look outside you can take off the remove before flight covers if you click on the tip of each blade uh, we have fully functioning windows and doors all around And that is really about it for this video. If you have any questions or you need to know any other information, you can contact me through the 105 uh, forum 
and I will be happy to help out anyone or answer any questions. Thank you for watching.